So uh, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us for today's webinar on the costs and environmental impacts of cultivated meat. Let me just get my laser pointer set up here. Uh, my name is Elliot Swartz, and I am a senior scientist at GFI focused on cultivated meat. And today we're going to be reviewing the results from two recently released studies, a life cycle assessment and a techno-economic assessment of large scale cultivated meat production. So I'll first give an introduction to the studies and discuss what is actually being modeled in these reports. And then we'll dive into the study design and key findings from the LCA and the TEA respectively before turning to the future directions and recommendations that follow from the insights from these reports. We'll also have time at the end for an extended Q&A session where we're joined by panelists from additional individuals that were involved in the creation of these reports. So before we begin, um, I do want to note a few housekeeping items. Uh, the first is that all attendees will receive a copy of the slide deck, uh, which contains the links to the reports as well as links to commentary materials written by GFI. You'll also receive a link to the recording, which will be uploaded to our YouTube channel following the talk. And you'd also, you're also welcome to submit questions throughout the talk using the Q&A function on your screen, as well as upload, upvote questions that you want to see answered. Our panelists will be monitoring the Q&A and answering some of the more simple questions throughout the talk. And then at the end, we'll get to some of the most highly upvoted or uh, prevalent questions. So let's get started. So for those that are unfamiliar with the Good Food Institute, GFI is a nonprofit developing the roadmap for a sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. And we accomplish this through work in three primary areas. Our science and technology work focuses on identifying the bottlenecks facing the alternative protein industry and mobilizes research and training resources that help solve those identified challenges. Our corporate engagement team assists companies and investors around the world to drive investment, accelerate innovation, and scale the supply chain for alternative proteins. And our policy work advocates for fair policy and increased public research funding for alternative proteins. We replicate this, world, this work around the world in key regions such as Brazil, India, Europe, Israel, the Asia Pacific region, and here in the United States. And all of our work is entirely funded by philanthropic donations. So the topic of today is cultivated meat technology. And cultivated meat is genuine animal meat or seafood that can replicate the sensory and nutritional profiles of conventionally produced meat because it's comprised of the exact same cell types arranged in the same or similar three-dimensional structure as animal muscle tissues. And you can see here the variety of different prototypes that have been created by some of the companies in this sector. And as of last year, there is now currently one approved product for sale in Singapore. However, what we'll be talking about today is really the future large scale commercial production of these cultivated meat products, rather than the relatively small scale at which they're produced today. So before we dive in, I'd like to review the uh, roles for the project as there were many different partners involved. The first is that the Dutch research firm CE Delft independently designed these studies, analyzed the data and wrote the reports. So I'm just going to be sharing the findings from these studies today, but we are joined by two members of the CE Delft team at the Q&A session at the end. The LCA was commissioned by GFI and the European organization Gaia and we're also joined by a member of Gaia for the extended Q&A. And the TEA was commissioned by GFI. Both of our organizations assisted with the research process but did not see or analyze any of the raw data. The data for these studies came from over 15 different companies across the supply chain, including five cultivated meat manufacturers and one government scientific body from Singapore. So this really makes the studies the first of their kind to use industry data to inform the model and its inputs rather than rely on speculative assumptions about what may occur in the future. 
So what are we actually modeling in these reports? So as I mentioned, we're projecting forward into the future and looking at a commercial scale cultivated meat production facility that might operate by the year 2030. The facility is capable of producing 10,000 metric tons of a minced cultivated meat product each year, such as a hamburger or a chicken nugget. And the cells are grown in suspension at relatively high density in stir tank bioreactors, otherwise known as cultivators at body temperature. The largest volume cultivator in this facility is 10,000 liters. And the differentiation phase of the process takes place for 10 days in a specialized perfusion cultivator. The medium that the cells are growing in is free of antibiotics, free of serum, and free of other animal-derived ingredients, and included amino acids derived primarily from a soy hydrolysate, but was also supplemented with amino acids produced from fermentation and chemical synthesis processes. The glucose was derived from corn, and there were a total of five recombinant proteins and growth factors produced via fermentation in the medium formulation. And we're going to be talking about all of these sorts of uh, details along the way. So here you can see a process schematic of the production line that exists in the facility from the seed train during the proliferation st stage into the differentiation stage. And we're not going to go into uh, a lot of detail on this slide, but it is important to note this slide uh, covers the amount of medium that is used as well as the time frame that it takes to grow the cells at each stage and contains information about the key parameters that we assume for the baseline scenario. But the takeaway is really that using this production line, we can produce about 3000 kilograms of meat every 42 days. And we essentially copy and paste this production line throughout the facility and operate these production lines in parallel in order to reach the designated 10,000 metric tons of meat per year. So what does the LCA look at? The LCA quantifies all of the inputs and outputs upstream of the product leaving the facility, a so-called cradle to gate study. So for cultivated meat, this includes resource extraction upstream, energy production needed for all of the inputs, including the medium and the cultivators, and transportation between those processes. For conventional meat, this means all of the agricultural processes are accounted for, such as the use of fertilizer and land used for feed, transport of feed and animals, and emissions at animal farms and processing facilities. The functional unit for the study is comparing one kilogram of cultivated meat to conventional meat, such as chicken, pork, and beef, or a high protein plant-based product. And we knew coming in that other studies had indicated that cultivated meat could be an energy intensive process. And this LCA was the first to analyze a conventional energy mix based off of a stated policy scenario and the global average of that policy scenario in the year 2030 that consists of about 56% fossil fuels as well as a sustainable energy mix where that energy comes equally split between wind and solar, as well as heat derived from geothermal heat. The environmental impacts were assessed using what's called the recipe endpoint and midpoint methods, where essentially different midpoints such as land use, water use, and carbon footprint are calculated and summarized into a single individual score. And we'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide. The LCA also ran various scenarios to assess how changes in key parameters, such as the production runtime, the cell density, the cell volume, and how efficiently the medium was used, how, how changes in those parameters could affect the environmental impacts of the overall process. So this is a little bit more information on the recipe single score. And as you can see here, this is the total environmental impact categories that are analyzed using this uh, method. And this essentially easily translates these various midpoint metrics, again, such as land use, global warming, water use, et cetera, into a single summary score that is more easily interpreted. And so in the y-axis of some of the uh, data that will be shown, you'll see this indicator of MPT, which is essentially the summarized score from these uh, calculations. Now, it's also important to note what we're comparing to for the comparison between cultivated meat and conventional meat production. 
So conventional meat production is modeled as an intensive West European system that is significantly below global averages in terms of its environmental impacts. In addition to this, we assume that there would be uh, additional improvements for conventional meat production by the year 2030. So for all of the comparisons that you're going to see, you, you can assume that the conventional meat scenario is also using sustainable energy at the farm and the feed facilities, that there would be fewer ammonia emissions from increased outdoor grazing, there would be fewer methane emissions from the use of feed additives, and that there would be no land use change associated with the soy that's used in the feed. And collectively, these assumptions further reduce the carbon footprint of conventional beef by 15%, pork by 26%, and chicken by 53%. And so these really ambitious assumptions for conventional meat production were set in order for us to draw robust conclusions about the findings in the LCA. It's also to account for some uncertainty in the production process of cultivated meat, as there's still some uncertainty in the overall parameters and inputs. So onto the, the data from these reports. This is really one of the, the summary takeaways from the LCA shown here, which essentially shows that cultivated meat has a reduced environmental impact compared to all forms of conventional meat production when sustainability when sustainable energy is used. So you can see here in this cultivated meat scenario produced using conventional energy that it outperforms any form of conventional beef production, but scores slightly higher than chicken and pork production. You'll also note that these gray bars here indicate the global average of the carbon footprint of each respective conventional meat category. And essentially, depending on where you are in the world and how efficient your production processes are, the footprint varies quite dramatically. And so if we look at the cultivated meat compared to conventional or cultivated meat produced with conventional energy compared to the global averages of chicken and pork production, they're somewhat competitive. But the key from this figure is really to show that cultivated meat when produced using sustainable energy can undercut any form of conventional meat production in terms of its environmental impact. Now you'll also see that the environmental impact is really driven by a few key categories, the global warming or the carbon footprint, land use, water consumption, fine particulate matter, and human toxicity. And human toxicity is essentially environmental contaminants from things like uh, pesticides and fertilizers, for instance. So we're gonna show some data that drills in deeper to each of these four categories, starting with the global warming impact category, which you can see makes up the majority of the environmental impact for cultivated meat production. So looking closer in at this carbon footprint graph, you can see that the overall trend is conserved. Cultivated meat produced using conventional energy significantly outperforms the carbon footprint of any form of beef production, but scores slightly higher than the ambitious scenario set forth for chicken and pork production. Additionally, you can see that again, this is somewhat competitive with the global average of chicken and pork production. But the key here is that switching to sustainable energy can reduce the carbon footprint by cultivated meat. And cultivated meat, essentially what we're doing here is concentrating the energy use at a single point along the value chain, rather than really spreading it across the value chain as it is in conventional meat production. So what this means is that a lot of the energy that is put into the process comes directly from energy use at the facility. And this gives manufacturers in the future really a lot of power to locate their future facilities in regions with accessible and affordable sustainable energy sources, or possibly generate the energy themselves through the installation of things like solar panels uh, nearby or on top of their facilities. Additionally, regions that increasingly substitute their meat sourcing or production with cultivated meat could see greater rates of overall emissions reductions. So as everyone races to decarbonize throughout the coming decades, if we're able to switch to cultivated meat, while decarbonizing our energy system, then we can have additional benefits in, in, in seeing uh, emissions reductions in our agricultural and meat production sectors.
So let's look closer at what's really driving this energy use uh, for cultivated meat production at the facility. And you can see that the contribution to the carbon footprint uh, broken down per process stage here is driven primarily by this large scale proliferation stage where essentially we're growing these cells in very large cultivator tanks at very high volumes. And if we look more closely at what's driving the carbon footprint during this particular process stage, you can see that it comes from this heat exchanger or the cooling of these cultivators. And now multiplying these together indicates that this cooling accounts for about 75% of the overall carbon footprint of cultivated meat production. Now you might be asking yourself, uh, I thought these cells are being cultured at, at body temperature. Doesn't that mean we have to heat the cultivator? Well, it is true that we do have to heat the medium in the cultivator up to body temperature, but we actually take a quite a conservative assumption in the LCA that states that these cells, because they're growing so quickly and metabolizing their inputs so rapidly, that heat is a metabolic byproduct of this metabolism and that we run the risk of actually overheating the cultivator if we don't apply cooling actively throughout the cultivator tanks during production. This is somewhat common in the fermentation industry where microorganisms have very high metabolic rates, but there's still some uncertainty whether or not cooling would be needed at all for cultured meat. In fact, some calculations assume that at these densities and at these volumes, that cooling may not be needed at all. And even if it is needed, then we could use less in energy intensive forms of cooling called passive cooling, where manufacturers would have multiple different options to implement at their facility. And this can in turn substantially lower the energy demand at the facility. And so what we're really comparing to here in these scenarios are ambitious assumptions set for conventional meat production and very conservatively high assumptions set for energy use at the cultivated meat facility probably representative of an upper estimate for energy use. Now, what this does call out is that more research is needed into the cell metabolism and the oxygen consumption rates of these cells used in cultivated meat production. That knowledge will essentially inform us about how much metabolic heat we can expect to be produced by these cells during the production process, and then therefore inform the cooling requirements during production. So future LCAs should look to incorporate this information or collect these data uh, in future studies. So we examined the electricity use for production of cultivated meat, but we wanna know what else is driving this environmental impact. And you can see here that the cell culture medium accounts for about 40% of the environmental impacts in the sustainable energy scenario. And if we look at what's causing this environmental impact, it's actually the fermentation processes upstream in the supply chain. So the production of things like recombinant growth factors, proteins, and some of the supplemented amino acids in the cell culture medium. And these are fairly uh, resource intensive uh, processes that are produced at sort of industrial facilities. And so manufacturers could look to other options to further reduce their environmental impact. So for instance, we could source amino acids entirely from plants or other organisms, and we could alternatively produce recombinant growth factors and proteins in plants or using cell-free systems. And this could in turn further reduce the environmental impacts of the cell culture medium. So the feed conversion ratio uh, is a calculation that looks at the total amount of feed needed to generate a certain amount of meat. And basic thermodynamics would essentially predict that cultivated meat would use resources more efficiently than conventional animal rearing because these resources are gonna be spent only on growing the cells that we need for meat production rather than maintaining the day-to-day -day activities of an entire animal's body throughout its lifetime. And so this is a simplified graph from the LCA that shows the feed conversion calculated as the total kilograms of feed in per kilograms of meat out. And you can see that cultivated meat is approximately three and a half times more efficient 
than chicken, which is known to be the most efficient mode of animal meat production, and up to nearly 16 times more efficient than beef production at converting these feed inputs into meat. Now, so what follows from this is that we essentially need less feed in order to produce the same amount of meat. And so that means we need probably less land to grow that feed on. And this is actually true. So you can see in this graph here from the land use calculated in the LCA that cultivated meat compared to conventional meat requires about 63% less land than chicken, 72% less land than pork, and up to 95% less land than beef. Now, importantly, the land use varies only approximately 5% between these energy scenarios for cultivated meat. So this land use is really independent of the energy that we're using for production. This is just sort of a conserved aspect of cultivated meat production where we can expect great uh, improvements in, in the amount of land that we use. Now, given that animal agriculture uses approximately 77% of global agricultural land, there's really a large uh, opportunity cost to not using this land in other ways. So for instance, if we were able to recover land from switching from conventional meat to cultivated meat, then that land could be repurposed to rebuild habitats, sequester carbon through ecosystem restoration for renewable energy development or installation, or simply just to feed more humans. And so this is really one of the largest long-term levers that we have available to us in fighting climate change, deforestation, and biodiversity loss, and something that I think will be really increasingly important to consider in the coming years and decades of how we use our land to generate our meat. So the LCA also examined particulate matter formation, uh, which can be thought of more simply as air pollution. And you can see here that conventional meat production, uh, the air pollution is really driven by these ammonia particulates. And this is due to the manure and fertilizer use for their production. Whereas in the cultivated meat scenarios, you can see that the particulates are mainly dominated by sulfur dioxide, which comes from the mining of raw materials upstream in the supply chain, as well as some of the electricity that's uh, generated uh, and needed during the production process. Nevertheless, if cultivated meat is produced with sustainable energy, then this could lead to 29% less air pollution compared to conventional chicken, 49% less than pork, and up to 93% less than beef. And this also really doesn't account for potentially other additional benefits from the avoidance of odors produced by conventional meat farms and would make it substantially more tolerable to live near a meat production facility. So the last uh, data piece from the LCA that we're gonna cover today is the water use and specifically the use of blue water that is found in surface and groundwater reservoirs but does not include rainfall. You can see from this graph that if cultivated meat is produced using sustainable energy here, then about this would require about 78% less blue water than beef production. And depending on the energy source that you're using, could use slightly more than chicken and pork or about the same as chicken and pork production. So it's important to also note that uh, the scarcity of blue water is region dependent, and these numbers really should be used as a general guidance. So if a manufacturer wanted to make any specific claims about water use compared to a conventional product, then they need to calculate the blue water use uh, from the region that their facility exists in and compare that to the conventional meat production uh, in that region specifically. So for the conclusions for the LCA, uh, we can really see that the environmental impacts of cultivated meat production are driven by three categories. The amount and sourcing of energy used at the facility, how the inputs for the medium are sourced and produced, as well as how efficiently that medium is actually used. Just to highlight and underline this point that sustainable energy is really the key to unlocking 
all of cultivated meat's uh, environmental and climate mitigation potential and really mutually reinforces these global efforts toward decarbonization. Again, decarbonization in the energy sector uh, would lead to benefits for cultivated meat production in a way that's probably not achievable uh, for conventional meat production, for instance. And then the real takeaway here is that cultivated meat outperforms any form of conventional meat production when sustainable energy is used in its production. So for the TEA study, what we're looking at is essentially the same model facility and parameters that we just showed in the LCA. And we're essentially asking how much does this facility cost? Specifically, the TEA considers the capital expenditures such as the equipment and the installation of that equipment in the facility and the operating costs for the facility such as the electricity needed, heat, water, labor, media and other inputs, wastewater treatment, as well as maintenance for the equipment. Overall, these contribute to the cost of goods for one kilogram of cultivated meat. So it's important to note that we're looking here at production costs and production costs are not equivalent to prices or price tags that you'd see in the supermarket or on a restaurant menu. Prices account for additional overhead such as sales or marketing or room to make a profit. And that's not what we're looking at here. That will have to be set by individual cultivated meat manufacturers. So again, the numbers that you'll see are related to the production costs uh, for one kilogram of cultivated meat specifically. So we assume that there would be food grade equipment in the facility and the costs were benchmarked to processes in the food sector rather than the pharmaceutical sector. And then finally, because this is so conceptual and forward looking, this implies an uncertainty between minus 20% and plus 40% for the cost metrics that you'll see. And there's a higher level of uncertainty given to these specialized perfusion cultivators because essentially they do not yet exist at the size and the scale needed uh, for this particular uh, facility. So previous studies have shown that the media as it's produced today is really the driver of production costs. And so the TEA set forth to analyze uh, the same scenarios where in the LCA we examined the high or inefficient use of medium shown here, as well as the low or efficient use of medium, where essentially there's a fewer amount of inputs in the medium compared to a higher amount of inputs in the medium in these three scenarios uh, for medium use. But you can see clearly here that the production costs of cultivated meat uh, using today's medium are dominated by the, the cost of the medium itself. In fact, over 99% of the cost of production would be accounted for by the medium. And in turn, 99% of those costs come from the recombinant proteins and growth factors that are in the medium. And so this has really been known for a while since the dawn of the industry. And one of the unique aspects of the TEA was that manufacturers indicated the use of recombinant albumin protein at relatively high concentrations in their media. And that makes up about 80 to 95% of the cost of recombinant proteins depending on how efficiently the medium is used. So albumin is one of the most common proteins found in the blood and serves a very important role in transporting things like lipids, vitamins, and other micronutrients to the cells throughout your body. And so in the absence of serum and therefore albumin in the cell culture medium, what manufacturers are doing is adding in rec recombinant albumin to restore that function of carrying these very important nutrients to the cells within the cultivator. So this highlights a big opportunity to potentially uh, identify ways to reduce or eliminate albumin from the cell culture media, and then in turn significantly reduce the overall uh, costs of the cell culture medium. And the good news is that some, some uh, serum-free medium for certain stem cell types are already free of albumin. So this suggests that it would be possible to reduce or potentially eliminate entirely albumin from the production of certain cultivated meats. <clears throat>
So you'll see that, you know, even if the medium is used very efficiently today, then the cost of production is still likely going to be above $100 per kilogram. And so the rest of the data that I'll walk through really goes through different scenarios that show how we can generate a more cost competitive price for cultivated meat. And the first and most obvious thing to do is to reduce the costs of these recombinant proteins and growth factors in the medium. So under realistic cost reduction scenarios, you can see that the uh, cost of the medium no longer becomes a dominant force and the cost of goods of one kilogram of cultivated meat is approximately $17.50. So you can see here, the cell culture medium now makes up a fraction of the overall cost rather than 99% of the cost. Now, this would require the scaling of the production of these growth factors, as well as the purification of these uh, ingredients at food grade uh, standards. And this is already beginning to happen in the industry from the supply side. And so we're pretty uh, optimistic that these scenarios set forth as listed in the bottom can be achieved in the relatively short term if they're not being achieved already. Now, importantly, the TEA doesn't account for other efforts in the industry that are aiming to further reduce the burden of costs from the recombinant growth factors and proteins in the medium. So for instance, there are a numerous amounts of ways that we could further reduce the costs, such as by engineering different variants such that they could be more potent and we need to use less of them. We could try to find biofunctional equivalents from plants and substitute those in. Or we could use slow release systems that effectively uh, use these ingredients more efficiently. So there's a lot of current research going on, both in the private sector as well as in academia to further uh, lower the costs of these growth factors. But the takeaway really is that under realistic scenarios, uh, the cell culture medium no longer becomes the dominant driving uh, driver of costs. And rather it switches to this large portion of capital expenditures that you can see here makes up the majority of the remaining costs. So let's look in a little bit deeper about what these capital expenditures actually are. So as it turns out, a large commercial scale production facility has a relatively high cost. And the cost of the facility is estimated to be about $450 million in this study. You can see that the costs are overwhelmingly dominated by these uh, large scale uh, cultivators during the proliferation phase, as well as the large scale perfusion cultivators uh, used during the differentiation phase of production. So not only are these pieces quite big and quite sophisticated, we actually need quite a bit of them to, in the facility to meet the designated production volume uh, on an annual basis. So it's also important to realize that if this facility existed today on earth, it would probably be one of, if not the largest animal cell cult culture and facility that exists. And we'd need about a hundred of these facilities to meet just 0.3% of the global meat demand by 2030. So you might be saying to yourself, well, you know, am I, am I going to see cultivated meat anytime soon? This is such a small percentage, even in a sort of optimistic outlook if we have a hundred of these facilities. But I think it's also important uh, to realize that the plant-based meat industry, which is you know, available in many grocery stores today, you can buy it in a lot of places, it's a thriving industry, and that currently also accounts for slightly less than 1% of the global meat production volume. So I think these numbers really just highlight how large of a marketplace the global seafood and meat market actually is. And really, I think, underscores the enormous market opportunity to develop and manufacture these large-scale cultivation tanks that could be more affordable, uh, food grade, and fit for purpose for cultivated meat production. So again, I think this will become increasingly important over time as the industry scales to uh, develop systems that could be more affordable and reduce this overall CapEx burden. Now, we're returning to this scenario where at $17.50, we have now reduced the price of the growth factors uh, and the recombinant proteins in the media. And we have this large 
piece of capital expenditure that accounts for the majority of the costs. Now, this scenario assumes that the payback time for that facility that we just discussed of $450 million would be paid back in four years. And so in the TEA, there were multiple scenarios run for ex basically extending this payback time throughout the lifetime of the facility. And you can see that when this happens, the yearly CapEx requirements to pay back gets diluted out over time. And now the capital expenditure in this sort of lifetime of the facility scenario is now no longer the driving force of the cost, although it's a big contributor still. So why do we think um, this might occur in this industry? Well, the first is that governments could carry some of the investment burden, such as in the form of subsidies. Additionally, as the industry scales, it's likely that there's going to be some degree of learning and experience that increases the overall efficiency of these processes, uh, as well as decreases the perceived risk of investment. And then finally, there are longer term motivations related to the environment, to global health concerns, to animal welfare, et cetera, that are, tend to be less profit seeking. And so I think we're optimistic that the payback time can be extended to some degree over the lifetime of the facility for cultivated meat. But more importantly, I think this really underscores that reducing the CapEx burden on cultivated meat manufacturers and the industry at large will really be critical to the rate of scaling of the industry. This could be a really rate limiting step. And ultimately this affects the accessibility of these products um, at lower prices for consumers. So now we're left with this scenario uh, that sort of adds on these reduction in the medium, uh, the growth factors in recombinant proteins, and we extend the payback time to over the lifetime of the facility. And so we wanted to ask what other sorts of realistic process improvements could we use in order to bring the cost down even further. So we analyzed the same sorts of scenarios from the LCA by increasing the cell density, assuming that the cells might be slightly bigger and that the production time overall could be shortened essentially by speeding up the doubling time of the cells in the uh, cultivation tanks. And essentially this leads us to a uh, cost of goods as low as $5.66 per kilo or $2.57 per pound in these scenarios that were analyzed in the TEA. So you'll note that the breakdown of the costs are now sort of equally distributed among several different categories. Uh, and now electricity actually is the dominant cost factor. And so we didn't analyze additional scenarios, but it's important to keep in mind from the LCA that this is really an upper estimate of energy and therefore electricity use at the facility. And additionally, there are already places that are beginning to see sustainable energy become more affordable than conventional energy mixes that contain fossil fuels. So not only would there be motivation we think in the future for cultivated meat manufacturers to locate and source sustainable energy uh, from an environmental perspective, but it could also help them reduce the overall costs of the production of cultivated meat as well. Now, it's important to, to rec recognize the context as well of these cost reductions. And so what these process optimizations really are doing uh, is it means that you need fewer cultivators in the facility and therefore fewer personnel to operate and maintain those cultivators now in order to meet the designated volumetric output of the facility. So under these process optimizations, what actually happens is the footprint of the facility shrinks you have fewer pieces of equipment in the facility and your CapEx decreases from $450 million to around $250 million. And the amount of staff that are employed and working at your facility would decrease from 200 to 130. So again, this really underscores that, you know, more efficient production is going to allow us to defray this burden of CapEx on the industry and ultimately allow the industry to scale more efficiently and rapidly. So the conclusions for the TEA are that the production costs we see are driven by how we source and produce the inputs in the medium, how efficient that medium is used, 
and the overall capex of the production facility. You can see that these two are shared between the LCA and the TEA, and really how we use this medium and how we source it uh, is super important from a cost and environmental perspective. There's really no way around that. The conclusion really, I think, is that competitive cost ranges uh, with some conventional meats can be achieved if medium costs are dramatically reduced, if we can relax the payback times for the facility, and if process productivity is very highly optimized. Now, it's important uh, to have a sort of proper interpretation of all of the results that I just walked through. The first is that, as we see, the these reports really analyze sets of scenarios that decrease the production costs and environmental impacts from a baseline production scenario with a specified set of assumptions. Now, of course, these assumptions are informed by the industry as well as several other experts that consulted for these projects. And so we think that this paints one of the more accurate representations of how cultured meat could be produced in the future, but it is just one set of assumptions and there are other alternatives that could be pursued. The model does not importantly represent any single product or company. It's really just a generic model and it does not make claims about any single product or process. And the data gaps still exist and that some of these assumptions that we have may change as the nascent industry matures. And so it's important to update uh, these sorts of studies as we learn more about the progress in the industry. Therefore, you shouldn't really take these results as unchanging truths or the absolute lower boundaries of production costs or environmental impacts. But rather, I think we should really use the insights from these reports uh, to address some of the technical and economic bottlenecks that have stuck out along the way and use that to further address uh, those problems now such that they aren't as big problems in the future. So let's talk a little bit about some of the insights from the report that we can begin to do this. The first, <clears throat> the first thing is to look, <clears throat> excuse me, um, at hybrid products. <clears throat> oh, swallow that water wrong. Um, hybrid products are essentially mixing cultivated meat with plant-based meat products to some percentage. So this could mean mixing in cultivated fat with a plant-based meat product or using something like a 50-50 blend. And not only could this offer really compelling, I think, near-term opportunities to improve the sensory attributes of a plant-based meat product, but would also help de defray the overall costs and environmental impacts of cultivated meat. So hybrid products were not analyzed in this particular study, but it is true that the first approved product by Eat Just is technically a hybrid product reported to be about 70% animal cells and 30% plant proteins and other ingredients. And in fact, I think it's expected that the first and second generation products that come to market are really going to be heavily skewed toward these hybrid products. And so it's really important to get an indication of what their cost and environmental impacts would be. Now, additionally, as we mentioned, this doesn't make any spe specific product claims, uh, but these could be interesting to analyze and further inform us about technology development, how different inputs are sourced, as well as the go-to market strategy for these companies uh, in the sector. Um, specifically, I think there's room to analyze and compare to seafood categories of, of products and comparing to conventional seafoods. Um, that specifically wasn't analyzed really in this study. And additionally, we talked about how the facility location matters. Um, so manufacturers should really locate in regions uh, where sustainable energy can be sourced or they can produce it themselves, but the location can influence a lot of other factors such as the distribution, access to certain resources, as well as the socioeconomic effects of, let's say, a facility in an urban versus a rural environment. So it'll be interesting uh, and important to analyze really, you know, what a facility would look like in northern rural Canada compared to Southern California, what a facility looks like in Mexico compared to that in Brazil. And these sorts of region specific analyses are going to be important to inform uh, local policy making as well as uh, analyzing some of the 
uh, sort of add on effects from a switch from cultivated meat or from conventional meat to cultivated meat. So there are also several knowledge gaps in technology development areas that will be important to potentially further reduce the costs and environmental footprint of cultivated meat. Medium recycling is one of the technologies that could assist in the resource utilization and increase the productivity of the process. Uh, essentially, conceptually, how this could work is by capturing and recycling in these expensive and important recombinant growth factors and proteins while getting rid of the waste streams produced by those cells. Now, conceptually, um, this uh, is easy to imagine, but maybe harder to implement. And as of yet, there's really no sophisticated medium recycling technologies that exist. We talked about how understanding the metabolic requirements of cells will be important for informing the future energy demand at these facilities, as it tells us how much heat is released by the cells and therefore how much cooling we might need to employ at the facility. But it can also inform us about the selection of the raw material uh, that is put into the medium. So for instance, the study assumes that the amino acids will come mostly from soy hydrolysate, which actually has a fairly suitable amino acid profile, but still needs some supplementation from amino acids produced from fermentation. But there may be uh, other plants or organisms that have even more suitable amino acid profiles, um, or those sources could be blended together to come up with something that's more complete. And either way, there's really no consensus as of yet in the industry for which raw materials are going to be used. And this really has important implications downstream in the future supply chain. And then finally, we discussed uh, improving these cultivator designs to defray the costs of CapEx, as well as the operation and maintenance costs in the facility. And additional uh, areas of research and technology development are listed here with special attention, I think, to understanding how perfusion cultivators can scale, as well as potentially analyzing continuous processes, automation at the facility, as well as the utilization of computational models to better inform the overall process design. And so future uh, TEAs as well as LCAs may look to, to sort of hypothetically um, or using data from industry partners, analyze continuous processes or automation or really any of these different categories. Now, lastly, it's important to highlight that I think we're really working against the clock when it comes to the climate um, and the industry is not going to need to scale at the timely rates needed um, if policies really continue to support incumbent industries without any support for alternatives. And so there are several things that follow uh, from this for policy and other stakeholders. The first is that there's really a glaring difference between the amount of money that has gone into the private industry versus that available for public open access research. And so we just discussed so many of you know, the available opportunities to investigate improvements for cultivated meat production and the potential for the technology is so large that governments really should increase the public funding into R&D programs. Additionally, governments and nonprofits should incorporate cultivated meat into their climate change and other sustainability policy strategies. I think as shown by these and other studies, cultivated meat holds really massive potential for becoming a sustainable protein option for a growing population. And special attention should probably be given to analyzing and incentivizing how we're going to use land for future meat production. And then finally, governments can provide incentives and financing options for the large amount of new infrastructure that's going to be needed for this industry to scale. And this could come in the form of debt support or subsidies or sovereign green, green bonds, for instance, and other incentive mechanisms that support development. Now, finally, it would be remiss to say that cultivated meat really offers a lot of additional benefits. And so we really should mention these along the way, although they weren't specifically analyzed in these studies. So if cultivated meat were to substitute for conventional meat in our future diets, then cultivated meat could mitigate the looming threat of antibiotic resistance as it does not require any antibiotics for production. About 73% of global antibiotic use is used for the production of animals uh, for meat. Uh, 
Additionally, cultivated meat could decrease the incidence of meat and seafood related foodborne illnesses, and it can be produced without met heavy metal or microplastic contaminants in the case of seafood. And then finally, cultivated meat could help mitigate against future pandemics that are caused by zoonotic diseases spreading from intensely, intensively farmed animals to humans. If we can decrease the amount of intensively farmed animals on earth, then this could be a potential future. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge all of the different partners that were involved in these studies. Uh, a special thanks to the research team at CE Delft, who will be joining us in just a minute for the, the Q&A session. Uh, a special thanks to Gaia for co-commissioning the LCA report and all of the companies that contributed their data and expertise along the way. Uh, importantly, none of this work would be possible without GFI's family of donors. And we have many plans to build upon these analyses in the future. So please do contact us if you'd like to support our work. So thank you for your attention. And I hope you learned a little bit more about what cultured meat production may look like in the future. As mentioned, we're gonna share all of these uh, materials. They're free to download, um, free to review. And um, thank you to all of the, the partners involved in these studies and um, we'll catch you later.